Lead me to some soul today. Oh, teach me, Lord, just what Welcome, everyone, to episode number 65 of a series of episodes that we're calling Leading Others to Christ. Those of you who have been listening and watching, you know that during these episodes, we're going to be focused on evangelism. Uh, we have a lot of goals, and, and this has been so exciting for me, uh, the old guy in the room, if you will, but of, of the people that I've met, haven't met them in person, but meeting them on Zoom and uh, the things that we've learned about what other Christians are doing uh, around the country here in evangelism has been so exciting. But one of our goals is to uh, stir each other up. Uh, to stir each other up to love and good works, especially in the area of reaching family, friends, and neighbors with the gospel of Christ. My name is Dan Barker, and I preach for the Creekside Church of Christ in Franklin, Indiana, uh, where I also serve as one of the shepherds. Franklin is about 20 miles south of uh, downtown Indianapolis. Uh, those of you that know me, you know that I'm passionate about our, our topic today. I'm passionate about evangelism and and I have been since I obeyed the gospel when I was 21 years old in Owensboro, Kentucky. Uh, and ever since then, I've been, I'm going to use some words that most of us are familiar with. I've always been striving to teach others, striving to sow the seed, to be a fisher, to learn how to be a fisher for men, obviously, and women, to make disciples, to persuade men and women, and to teach others to teach. I see myself more as a teacher than I do a preacher. But I always try to remember what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And the things that you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men, obviously to faithful men and women, who will be able to teach others also. And then later in that same chapter, he's talking to Timothy about being useful for the master. Uh, and so back when all this COVID nonsense started back in 2020, came up with this idea of doing a podcast uh, and to identify the Christians out there, the men and women, the fellow workers who are doing this, who are involved in leading others to Christ, find out where they are, who they are, how they're doing their work, uh, and interview them and see what we, to encourage them and interview them to see what we can learn to help us in, in our work and, and wherever, we, wherever we might be. So we're so excited today to have with us somebody I'm confident we're going to learn a lot from. So get out your pen and paper. But uh, we've got Edwin Crozier today. Welcome, Edwin. Brother, good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. I was trying to think after we talked the other day, it's seven or eight years, I guess, ago that we uh, first met. Gay and I came up to uh, here. At least. Creek. Yeah, uh, up in Brownsburg, Indiana. And uh, But uh, so good to... Uh, to see you and uh, and see, I guess it was a smart move because it's like 18 degrees here now. What is it there? Oh, it's in the 60s here today. I yeah, think. yeah, that was a good. Among other things, that might have been a good move. But uh, but anyway, uh, we really do appreciate you taking the time to do this today, and uh, 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 I'm just looking forward to digging in here. And as I told you, I, a lot of this interview is very just conversation between us and. I'm going to play off some of the things that you say, and uh, uh, and uh, it seems like every time there's things that come up that I go, oh, I've got to talk to him more about that, or I need to ask another question. So, uh, But what we usually start out with, Edwin, is what we've started calling the elevator pitch or the short bio. So uh, for those that don't know who Edwin Crozier is, tell us uh, tell us uh, where you go all the way back to where you were born about how old you were when you obeyed the gospel. Not everything now, wow. but I, I said short bow and uh, kind of break us up to speed if you would. Okay. I'm Edwin Crozier and uh, I was born 1973 in Mountain Home, Idaho at the air force base there. Cause my dad was a career military fellow. We moved around to England and North Carolina and Texas and then England again. And finally, he retired in Northeast Arkansas, which is actually where I became a Christian up until my teen years. My uh, um, immediate family had been a part of the Baptist denomination, and uh, my dad had been raised by Christians. He had uh, gone into the Baptist church when he married my mom. Uh, my mom died when I was 12 years old. And uh, my dad ended up remarrying, 
um, a Christian, he was restored. And we, uh, I was, even, even as a teenager, I was baptized for the remission of my sins uh, at about age 13, maybe 14. I, I can't quite remember the, the, the year there. And for a few years, finished up high school, went off to college to be an aerospace engineer up in Wichita, Kansas. And there was a brother up there who basically took some good interest in me and prompted and provoked and encouraged me to start doing some preaching. And by the time that brother Bob Allen was done with me and my two and a half years up there, that's what I decided to do. So I got into preaching when I graduated college. I did not get an aerospace engineering degree. That was just, it was, it was, it was awful. I hated it. I hated every minute of it. And so I ended up skipping out of that one, but I did get a degree in English. And I started preaching in Tennessee, and then I spent some years in Texas. I spent some years in Tennessee again, and then up in Indiana where you and I met. And now I've been in Florida, just north of Tampa in Lutz, Florida, for about seven and a half years. I am married. We've been married for, I'm probably going to get this wrong now, 26 years. And I have four children age 14 to 24. What's your wife's name? Marita. Marita. Okay. Yes. Uh, I, I, I did this a while ago uh, in an interview, but uh, just real, I'm going to do this real quick. Give a shout out to her and, yeah. and, and, and watch this. How, what, what kind of a role does she play in the work that you do? Well, Marita is fantastic. Uh, okay. The, that is, that is hard to label down in such a short episode, but of course the hospitality that she offers, uh, especially here among the brothers and sisters in our congregation, uh, she, I mean, look, I'm just going to be honest with you. One of her big roles is helping this big head stay a little bit smaller. Uh, I mean, that's, uh, she's, she's helpful. And I don't, I, I don't mean that in a bad way. It's actually a very, very good thing. She views things from a different perspective than I do. And so there are things that start to frustrate and irritate me and she can typically pull me back and help me see the other side of it. There are times when I'm letting her know about some irritating disagreement I'm having with someone in the congregation and she's able to say, well, let's get, how, how about we pull back on this and view this this way. Maybe this is what they're thinking. That's always very, very helpful. And so uh, lots and lots of good support. So you know, I, I'm, I'm really, I, I'm just thinking here, uh, and I'll have to talk to Matt about this. I could go back, you're number 65. I could go back and interview all of the spouses. Uh, and that would be, that, <laughs> that would be interesting. But, uh, but really, uh, and I apologize for all the, wives out there that I haven't mentioned uh, previous interviews, but none of us could do what we're doing uh, with it to the level that we do it without, I know how much gay helps me and encourages me. Uh, and I wouldn't be where I am. I'm literally, if it wasn't for her, for her. And uh, so you thank, uh, you thank your bride for me uh, for doing all the work that she does. You know, Edwin, look what you did there just in your bio uh, growing up, uh, in, in the, in the Baptist church, I did as well. And, uh, but your dad, uh, being in the military and living all over the place and, and where all the places that you went as a kid and the different, ex, different communities that you were in and all those things, uh, uh, they all have a, a, a role in, in helping develop, you know, who Edwin is today. And, and same thing with me and, and see, you brought, I was going to say, well, how'd that airspace engineer thing work out? But you already said, right? That was, uh, I wanted, you know what I wanted to say? What were you thinking? No, no, no. <laughs> uh, but well, I was uh, thinking that when I was in high school, I was a math science guy. And so that was the thing to do. Go, see, go. But, well, uh, hey, and you know what? This has come up on every interview. And I actually, I actually got the domain name. You, 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 this will make you laugh, maybe. But the, this idea of what if has come up so many times. Uh, it, the first interview I did was with Benjamin Lee. And I think you said you knew Benjamin. Yes. And he said something about it. Uh, and we started talking about the providence of God. And I said, I love to study that. I don't understand all of it, but I love to study it. And in and, uh, and this what if, it's come up every time. And I, I actually got the domain name the other day, the what if movement in the and we're using it in a theme this year uh, at Creekside of what if. 
And it's just like you said, help me now if I get this wrong, but when you went out there to, uh, uh, to, to study as an engineer, was his name Bob Allen? Bob Allen. And what, what if that's, that's look at the, what if there, if you hadn't gone to that school to do that, would you have met Bob Allen? Probably not. And of course, since you've brought up wives, I also have to include his wife, Jean. Bob and Jean took me under their wing. I actually lived with them for a year and a half, uh, worked for their son as a trim carpenter while I was up there. So lots and lots of influence there. So you see what I'm saying? What if you hadn't gone and what if Bob and Jean had not been the type of people that they were? Uh, because obviously they had a lot of influence on you and encouraged you to do what you're doing today. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, they did. That's just powerful stuff to me. But, uh, um, all right. Tell us, uh, tell us just real quick. Let's take just a couple of minutes. Tell us about the group there, the, the congregation that you're working with. Just tell us about the group. Okay. So I work with a group, uh, the Livingston Avenue church in Lutz, Florida. Uh, we often refer to ourselves as the Christians that meet on Livingston Avenue, we are at present, we, I don't know, COVID has, has hit, of course, some of our attendance and things have changed over the last two years, but I think we're at about 350 or so in attendance and in membership. We have six elders. Um, I should have counted up the deacons. I think we have 18 deacons, got lots and lots of Bible class teachers, a lot of good volunteer help. We've got quite a few folks here that are that are interested, not just in, you know, checking off the boxes and attending and all those things, but are really interested in getting the gospel message to others, uh, growing, being more devoted, more loyal, becoming more like Jesus. It, it really is a fantastic group of people to, to work with, to support and be supported by, to grow from these, these folks here. Uh, I mean, there's, there's challenges, there's, there, there you know, there's, there's folks here who will go ahead and say, well, you know, what about this, Edwin, and push me and prod me and give ideas, whether it's just understanding scripture or attitudes or even actions to take and behaviors to manifest. And it's it's a fantastic group of people. Well, that that is so good. Um, you know, and I know you know this, but the, the number of people out there that are listening and, and we've got. And interestingly enough, we've got a good audience and a lot of people are listening and it's growing all the time, but, and we give God the glory for that. But so many people that just, they couldn't even imagine going to a congregation that had 350 people going to a congregation that had six elders, 18 deacons, you know what I'm saying? They can't sure. even imagine what that would look like. Um, and uh, do you know Joseph Sullivan? I do. Okay. Not well, but I've met him. All right. So Joseph, we interviewed him earlier in some of the some of the uh, uh, articles and things that he's put together, some information. Uh, and this came up uh, in an earlier interview. But 54 percent of the churches of Christ average 34 people. Right. 54 percent. And, you know, and again, if you grow up around that, you think, well, every church out there looks like it. I mean, what? I'm at Creekside in uh, Franklin. We do not have 350 people. And, uh, and uh, so uh, just the dynamics of that, and I know you're, you're blessed to be there to be a part of that group and have all the help that you do. Uh, and sometimes I know that can be frustrating with all, all, the, all the moving parts, if you will. But, uh, but uh, we could talk a long time about just, just that and, and try to help congregations understand more. So I had this at, uh, asked to me early on, are you going to do one sometime just for elders that you could interview elders and get ideas from elders, how they could share what I know we're all autonomous, but if I can learn something from what you guys are doing down there that can help us here and somebody else that's listening, you know, that's great, right? We can, we can all benefit from that. But, um, um, all right. I have, uh, and you've answered part of this, but let's dig a little deeper. Okay. Uh, of all the things that you could have done, I, I tell the story all the time. When I was a kid, people would, that was Danny growing up. Danny, what do you want to be when you grow up? All right. Well, I found out in the fourth grade because of a coach and a teacher that I had that I wanted, when you asked me from the fourth grade on, I wanted to be a basketball coach. And I ended up doing that. But, uh, but, uh, and maybe when you were little, you wanted to be uh, an engineer. Uh, but I, the question is, 
it not, and I don't mean, I'm very serious about it, but of all the things that Edwin could have done and could still do, why are you so motivated and passionate about leading others to Christ? Why? That's probably been a journey. Not probably, that has been a journey. So let's go back to when I moved up to Wichita, Kansas. My goal at that time was, okay, get some training, figure out how to have a job so I can support a family and, and uh, just, just move forward. And in fact, at that time, I was absolutely, I, I remember I was dating um, a young lady who even said, now, look, I, whatever, I don't want to date. I don't want to marry a preacher. And at the time I said, oh, listen, you don't have to worry about that. That is, <laughs> that, that is not going to happen. Not going to happen. <clears throat> and uh, um, so that, of course, <laughs> she's not my wife now. So was, I didn't, I didn't lie to my wife now, but uh, uh, I was working or Bob and Jean, as I said earlier, really pushed me. And at that time it was more, here's an opportunity. And so let's take the opportunity. In fact, I pushed against the opportunity for a while. And so it was good that they, they really, they were, um, they applied pressure, we'll just say. <laughs> and so at that time, it, but, but it grew at that time. And I started recognizing a, um, an opportunity to help, an opportunity to encourage uh, there, there was a congregation that I got to spend a lot of time with during those uh, year and a half or so where, sadly, the preacher that they had had gotten involved in sin. They were, they were gun shy. They were very nervous about bringing on someone full time. And it was, it was uplifting to be able to step in the gap a little bit and help them out. And, and when someone while I was preaching there was actually baptized, even though, of course, you know, intellectually, I was able to say, well, that had nothing to do with me. That was that was her parents. There was still the, the joy in being able to watch that happen and even even be able to be a small part of that uh, was was something that was very exciting. As the years went on, I have to admit there was a time when when preaching oftentimes felt more like a job than a passion. And I've even said in the last couple of years, COVID was very helpful for me because I, I kind of felt like, you know, my discipleship and preaching as a career had kind of all wrapped up together. And some of those times, I'll be honest with you, I continued doing what I was doing because I thought, well, there's nothing else I can do right now. It, and and uh, I'm, I'm thankful that the Lord brought me through that because over the past five, six years, especially since I've been here in Florida and growing. The, the reason why I am continuing with it now is the recognition that sharing the gospel and preaching the gospel is a gift from God. And I don't, I don't mean the ability, though certainly any ability we have, we give praise to God, and that's, that's a gift from him and a grace. But I, I look at Paul, and especially Ephesians, and in Ephesians chapter 3, as he's talking about the grace he received to be able to proclaim the gospel— to the Gentiles. And he's writing that while he's in prison. So, so here he is suffering for the gospel. He calls himself not a prisoner of Rome, but a prisoner of Jesus Christ. It's, it's, it's because of Jesus that he is in jail. Jesus has him in prison, uh, not, not Caesar. And it's fat. And yet in the midst of that, he's able to say, essentially, I wouldn't have it any other way because what I get to do to share the gospel is a gift. And whether we're talking about uh, growing and and uh, growing in discipleship, those who have been Christians for years, or whether we're talking about taking the gospel to someone who's never even heard it, and now they're getting to hear it for the first time, those opportunities are just a straight up gift from God, and and the opportunity to be involved in that, uh, whether. Um, uh, I hate to use this word, but I really only mean being supported. I was going to say professionally being supported by a church. You know, it is the way that uh, I, I'm a, I'm an ox that's eating a lot of grain and they're not muzzling me. I'll tell you. And that's, that's a nice thing. And so whether it's in that role or even if it is, uh, Hey, you know, if, if I can't find a congregation that'll support me, but I have to go work a job, this is this sharing of the gospel is the thing that, that I want to do because it is a, the opportunity to do that, to be able to work with God. It, it's a gift. It's a gift. That's, that's so good. We could spend the rest of the time talking about that, but oh. uh, you know, it, um, 
And like you said, to be just a small part of the joy, you were talking about the one there that, uh, that, that obeyed the gospel. You know, uh, I've often thought about this, is that you have to experience it. You know, the, the joy, I, I talk all the time about, you know, we always talk about the celebrating when somebody's baptized, when somebody obeys the gospel, and rightly so, and we should, and we sing about it, and we should. Uh, but we talk all the time about celebrate the sowing, to celebrate the opportunities that we have to sow the seed and, and God, somebody else will plant or somebody else will water God and God's going to give the increase if it's going to happen. And, uh, but, uh, but just the, uh, the thought about this, once you've experienced that and, and you, and it's like, it's almost like it, something clicks up here and you get it. It's almost contagious, isn't it, Edwin? Absolutely. It is. There is, there is nothing like, sharing the gospel with someone or being involved in that and then going into the baptismal waters and plunging the numb under and, and lifting them up and giving that hug and the tears and the laughter, the joy. Um, there, there's nothing like that, nothing like it at all. And getting to be a part of that is fantastic. And I I think sometimes the reason that in so many places, uh, that's not going on is that people for whatever reason, they haven't experienced it or they have forgotten. Think about all the passages. And I mean, Paul and Peter, it's almost every uh, letter that you read, they're reminding you. How many times you hear, I'm I'm writing this to remind you. Uh, And we, and and I know you do that all the time in your preaching to remind the audience of, of who they are and what this is all about and what this is supposed to look like. But I think sometimes for, I don't know, uh, whatever reason we forget, but we need to experience that. We need to, uh, uh, to see that excitement and see those tears. And it should, it should cause us to stay on fire. And uh, that's what we're trying to motivate people to do. Uh, Jason Harden, you know, Jason, right? I love Jason. Jason. Well, uh, he's, he, he told me I needed to interview you and uh, (laughs) I've had had several people, but but he brought up the idea, and I hope I wrote this down right, the circle of discipleship. Oh, okay. Could you, could you sh- and you know what? Matt is already, we, we've got five minutes left. That This is going too fast. But anyway, tell us a little bit about the circle of discipleship, if you would. So here at the Livingston Congregation, when our elders recognize that our goal and mission is to make disciples, started asking the question, well, what does a disciple look like? What What is it that we're if we're, if we're taking someone, um, you know, from out in the world or even taking someone who's, who's attending with us and growing them up as a disciple, what's that going to look like when we're done with them and we've been successful, what are they going to look like? So we looking around at passages and scriptures and we realize that of course there's in a sense, we're starting Matthew one, go all the way to the end of revelation, but that's hard to hang into our mind. And of course, growing someone as a disciple means making them look like Jesus. And that's also uh, a good picture. And yet that's kind of one of those things that it's uh, where you got to say, okay, can we have some specifics? I get it. I'm supposed to look like Jesus, but look like Jesus in what ways? And so our, our elders, along with uh, the preachers here, we, we sat down and started walking through and said, okay, so what are, what are some of the main characteristics of discipleship? And we essentially, essentially there were five things that we focused on as far as what we want to share with our congregation. And we call it our circle of discipleship because we had one of the brothers here come up with a little graphic that is a circle, but we, a disciple is someone who honors God, uh, someone who learns from God, someone who loves like God, who leads others to God, all of that while abiding in God's word. And we, we pass that on. Everybody who becomes a member learns about that. I preach on it on occasion. Uh, in fact, I tell the brothers and sisters here that I'll know that we've talked about it enough when they start seeing the circle in their dreams. <laughs> oh, oh, that is so good. Uh, just, uh, uh, yeah, but Jason said, oh, you got to ask Edwin about the circle of discipleship. And, and sometimes just the, uh, just the phrases like that that resonate with us that can help us remember uh, as you well know, you're, you're a good teacher and a good preacher, but, uh, uh, so thanks for sharing that, uh, the conversion story. I know you've got several, but what maybe, uh, 
one or two, uh, especially one conversion story that comes to mind that you think the audience would uh, maybe it was unique circumstances or just something you want to share? Well, uh, looking through, um, wow, trying to pull out one. I, I guess one of the things is just as I've as I've taught and worked with people. I guess what I want to say is just over and over again, it, it's, it's not worked the way I thought it would. And so there's, there's lots of stories where I thought, wow, here's the person that is going to surrender to the Lord. And they did not. And they, they just rejected. I, I, boy, I can remember, I thought, and this is years ago when I was in Texas, a young man who was just eating it up and he was seeing it and he was going to submit and he was like, you know what? I need to be baptized for the remission of my sins. But hey, you know what? I, I need to talk to my mom about this first. He was a uh, uh, 17 or so, I think. And I'm like, okay, let's talk to your mom. Well, I don't want to talk to your mom with you and uh, my mom with you in the room. And I mean, it just went south right after that. It was gone. Yeah. And then there was the fellow that came into one of our little group studies that we were having in Texas who got so excited I mean, he, we, we studied with him and he was baptized that night and he went to go tell his former pastor about what the Bible says about that. And we never saw him again. So you know, those, those things where it didn't work, but then there's these other stories where, well, this is that, you know, they're okay. They're not even listening right now. I, I don't even know. Um, I remember again, years ago, um, a, a young lady who had married one of our members and we were all worried about it because she wasn't a Christian. And I, I don't recommend that because more often than not, the non-Christian pulls the Christian down. We studied with her and she rejected the whole thing. She was not going to be a part of that at all. But she would come to church with her husband now and then. And like two years later, all of a sudden it turned around and we were able to study and she became a, a Christian, a child of God. Really, really powerful. Um, I, I know that I've got, I guess, here in the recent uh, past in this last year, I, I think of a, a fella who showed up at our building because he had had prostate cancer and had gone through that process and decided, you know what? God has given me a second chance here. I need to get right with the Lord. And he found a church building that was near his house and he came in and we had a process whereby we're following up with our guests. And so we were able to follow up with this brother. And now he is a brother. And here's the great thing. He and I have continued on with some of our studies in this last year. We were up at a Greek restaurant just up the road and we're sitting there studying our Bibles. And the next thing I know, this woman at the booth behind him comes up and says, I just want you guys to know how important this is. Are you all a part of a church nearby? Well, sure. Yeah. Our congregation meets about a mile down the road. Well, do y'all have a Wednesday night service? Well, yeah, we do. It'll be at 730 tonight. And she showed up and we've studied with her. And, and she became a Christian. Wow. And so just uh, it's, it's, it's those things where, you know, you're, you're not expecting it. it. It does not work. And it reminds me, this is one of the things I've tried to share with folks, the parable in Mark chapter four, where he talks about the seed that he says, the farmer goes out, he plants it and he doesn't know how it grows, but he wakes up and it grows. And that's, that's the thing for me is that I have had to recognize, I don't know why the seed works. Right. And I don't know when it's going to work, but my job is just to get it out there. And there are going to be people that I think, well, they're just going to lap this up and they don't. And there are going to be people who respond to it quickly and then they fall away. And there are going to be people who respond to it and stick with it a while, but then they kind of fizzle out. But then there are going to be people that I didn't expect at all who are actually going to jump in and they're going to grow and they're going to stick with it. And, and then they grow up and start influencing other people. And I think that's that's the biggest thing that I've learned, not that I've had a particular story that has just stood out to me as as so amazing, but just yes. the, the conglomeration of those stories showing that I really don't have any idea why this works or when it's going to work. So what I need to do is just try to share as much as I possibly can. Well, wow. I wish we had more time. There's, there's a, I'd like to unwrap some of those things. That That is so good. It's so powerful to... Uh, to remember, and I, and I love that parable there, that seed, it didn't know how it grew, and, and it's true, but uh, the di the dynamics, but that, to me, that's part of the excitement of all of it, and that keeps us going, right, because we don't know, what if, what if, what if that one actually does get it, they say no today, but then two years down the road, all of a sudden, they show up, and 
something's happened to them or like the guy that, uh, you know, the changes that happen in people's lives all the time. The guy gets prostate cancer and, he, and all of a sudden he's starting to look at life different and going, wait a minute, uh, I need some answers here, right? I need I need to, some some direction. Uh, uh, wow. Somebody wants to reach out to you. And they say, I want I need to I need to know this Edwin guy. Is there <laughs> hey, is that okay if they would you share contact information with them? Absolutely. They can reach out to me. Um, my email is edwin at godswayworks.com. They can call me or text me at 317-902-9955. Um if I don't recognize their number, I will screen their call. So they need to leave a message or text. Yeah. me. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, you know, we, uh, I, the other brother here with me at the Livingston church, Andrew Roberts, we have our own podcast text talk. And so they can certainly listen to that. We've got a Facebook group. They can reach out through the, the information there. Good. I was going to, I had it in my notes here. That it, uh, when you said the uh, God's, way works. Uh, I remember the text talk that I was going to bring up and I was just about to forget it. Uh, and y'all, y'all do a good job with that. That's really good. I've listened to several of those. Uh, oh, thank you. So, uh, you know, uh, it's just, uh, just the excitement and, and talking to you, Edwin and, and, uh, anybody that's listening and, and watching here can see the energy that you have and the excitement that's in your voice and you're passionate about what you do, aren't you? Yes. Well, I hope so. I, I like to think of that. My wife usually calls it being intense, but however you want to say it. <laughs> oh, well, that, that that can be a good thing. All right. We'll, we'll take that as a good thing. Intense. All right. Well, listen, uh, thank you so much. And we will be following up with you. We've got some things that we're working on that have come, ideas that have come out of this and, 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 uh, it's just like your circle of uh, discipleship there. I want to follow up with you on that. And, and there's, uh, uh, we're, we're putting a bunch of things together here to share with other people. And uh, so, we, again, we, we appreciate you taking the time today, Edwin, to visit with us. And it's great to see you. And, and uh, maybe next time I'm down in Florida, we can have coffee or something. Oh, that but, would be fantastic. I would love to do that. Thank you so much for including me in this. Uh, I, I feel like I'm the, the plug nickel in the group that I've seen on your list. In fact, I kind of, I was a little worried because most of the people that I've learned things from are the folks you've already had on here, Max and Wesley and Linda and Jason is my friend, Andy. And so many of these folks, I'm like, I got nothing new. I learned it all from them. Oh, well, you know what I was thinking? You just made me think of something else. You said back to Bob and Gene Allen, right? Yes. You said, you said Bob has already passed away. He has, yes. And Gene said she's still alive. Yes. However, I think she's coming to the final years. Okay. I was just, I try to do this when I hear people think, you know, it's like, I, I try to talk to people all the time about those that influenced them, the mentors that they had in their past. Maybe, maybe just an idea, maybe reach out to Gene uh, while you still have time and say, thanks. Just yeah, I need to, to do that. I'm not very good at that. Just say, thank you for the, you know, just say you were talking to somebody the other day and, and, and it came up and, and you were reminded of how much time and energy that they gave you when you were a young guy and uh and that would probably mean that would just mean so much to her so uh anyway thank you brother and uh look forward to talking to you in the near future thank you who pray, melt my heart and fill my life give me one soul today